Okay, so our first speaker of the afternoon session um, is Michael Nachman from the University of California, Berkeley. So with uh, jet lag and a big lunch, my goal is to stay awake through the end of my talk. <laughs> uh, I wanna thank um, Molly for uh, organizing this uh, meeting. It's, it's been really fun and uh, I'm looking forward to the remaining talks. Um, so we heard this morning about mutation. Today I'm gonna to talk about uh, what happens after mutation and, and uh, once we have variation, what the fate of those mutations uh, is. And uh, this is uh, work we've done on environmental adaptation in house mice. Now we know a lot about the genetic basis of adaptation from uh, you know, well-studied examples like sticklebacks and color variation in, in mice, but really many of the best examples we have of the genetic basis of adaptive traits come from uh, traits that, that are either Mendelian or oligogenic. But of course most uh, traits are, are probably polygenic and complex, and that's probably true for most adaptive traits uh, as well, and we know much less about this. Uh, so uh, examples of these are things like body size and proportions. Uh, Bergman's rule, the observation that body size uh, increases as you go into colder environments, or Allen's rule, that extremities get smaller in colder environments. Both of these patterns are seen in many mammals. They're probably two of the best described ecogeographic patterns in mammals, and they apply in, in humans as well. So these are data uh, from indigenous humans from a variety of latitudes showing an increase in body mass uh, with latitude. So these are the kinds of traits that are very common, that are surely adaptive, they're surely polygenic, uh, but we really know much less ab about the genetic basis of them. And uh, I think that's uh, simply because the genetic basis of complex traits is, of course, uh, complex. And a number of people have pointed this out in, in various ways, uh, and even arguing that the total number of uh, genes that contribute to these traits uh, must be so large that it's impossible to enumerate them all, uh, and even if we could enumerate some of them, we wouldn't learn much in terms of, of general uh, properties. And I'm sure everybody read this uh, paper from Jonathan Pritchard's group uh, that had this sentence uh, from two years ago. Uh, there is an extremely large number of causal variants with tiny effect sizes on height. Most 100 KB windows in the genome include variants that affect height. Well, uh, I loved this paper, but I found that to be one of the most depressing sentences I had ever, <laughs> ever read. <laughs> I was ready to abandon my research program at that, at that point. Uh, but I, I think, uh, certainly, uh, I think, of course, there's overwhelming evidence uh, uh, for the observation that from GWAS, we, uh, uh, in fact, find many uh, loci of very small effect. Uh, but most of the traits studied by in human GWAS are traits that are under stabilizing or purifying selection. And, oops, this is not the, something lost in the Mac to PC transition. Uh, but I, the situation is, uh, is different in some situations. And, and in, in particular, uh, uh, Fisher and later Alan Orr uh, pointed out that in the early stages of an adaptive walk, when a population is far from its uh, optimum, we expect some mutations of large effect to be favored. And so I think in situations, we see this also under artificial selection, where uh, selection is very strong, then mutations of large effect may be favored uh, compared to situations where stabilizing selection is operating for populations close to the, the optimum. So um, I've been interested in using mice as a model to sort of explore this idea. Um, house mice uh, uh, in the, of the subspecies Mus musculus domesticus are native to Western Europe. Uh, they're actually native originally to the Middle East and moved into Western Europe with the spread of agriculture about 5,000 years ago. Uh, and then in the last few hundred years have been spread around the world. Uh, and so when mice uh, that uh, historically were adapted to a Mediterranean climate land in places like Canada or upstate New York, uh, surely those uh, populations are very far from their optimum and experience strong selection. And so we were interested in the possibility that we might be able to find some genes of fairly large effect that explain uh, more polygenic traits. So that's what I want to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about the genetics, and, then, and, and that's published work, but then I want to touch briefly on the role of phenotypic plasticity. And of course, we know for quantitative traits that the environment is also important, and we've been doing some experiments to try to measure how much plasticity there is in, in things like body size or the length of extremities. So we've conducted a transect of uh, house mice uh, across North and South America. Uh, we have uh, 10 mice sampled uh, per population. 
Uh, we have two transects of elevation in the Andes from sea level to over uh, 3,000 meters. Uh, and so all of these blue dots are places where we've sampled mice in the field and measured phenotypes on wild-caught individuals uh, and sequenced exomes and uh, whole genomes. Uh, and then the red dots are places where we've sampled live animals, brought them back to the lab, and established new uh, wild-derived inbred lines of mice. So we have roughly 10 strains of mice from each of these five populations. Uh, and this uh, makes it possible to measure phenotypes in a common laboratory environment and assess whether they have a, a genetic basis. And as I said, mice uh, that land in upstate New York are experiencing very, very different selection pressures than mice that, that land in, in a place like uh, Brazil. Uh, and it, Brazil is probably warmer than the ancestral range and, and less uh, uh, seasonal. Uh, and certainly, uh, the very northern reaches are colder than the ancestral range. So we think there's probably been selection in both directions. It's not just been selection for uh, adaptation to, to cold. This work was also motivated by uh, some work done by Carol Lynch uh, in the late uh, 1980s and early 90s. She uh, collected mice along the eastern coast of North America and documented clinal variation in body size and in nest building behavior. Uh, and she showed that these differences persist in the lab. Uh, I was completely convinced by her data on body size. Uh, I was a little skeptical of the idea that uh, nest building behavior would show genetic differences over such a short time scale uh, along this transect. Uh, but as I'll show you, she was correct on both counts. Uh, but her work really motivated a lot of what we did. So here's a, a, just some differences to give you a feel for the phenotypes. Uh, these are mice uh, from the equator, uh, from central Florida, and from upstate New York. Uh, in the wild and in the lab, we see clines in body size. These mice are 50% bigger than, than these mice. So these are substantial differences in body size that have evolved in just a few hundred uh, generations. You bring mice into the lab and you give them unlimited food and they're a little bigger than wild caught individuals. Uh, but those differences uh, persist uh, in the lab. Similarly, uh, we see clines uh, for the length of extremities, including ears and tails. Uh, so mice from the equator have big Mickey Mouse ears, and uh, mice uh, from 45 degrees north latitude have much smaller ears. And the same differences are seen in, in tail length, and these also persist in the lab. So mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, is this transect. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all, all of the uh, transects we've done. I'm going to focus on this one on, in eastern North America. This is work that was done by a former postdoc in my lab, Megan pfeiffer Rixey, who's now at Monmouth University. Uh, and uh, so, again, we have 10 mice per population, 50 mice, both exome and low coverage uh, whole genome sequences, and then live mice from the two ends of the transect. Uh, so first, among the wild-caught animals, we see clines for body size. This pattern is seen both in the northern hemisphere and in the southern hemisphere. Um, <clears throat> Those differences persist in the lab. And so here I'm just showing you body mass, but we see the same kind of pattern uh, for uh, body mass uh, and uh, length and, uh, and BMI. Uh, so uh, this is over the first three generations in the wild caught and the next two generations in the lab for females and males. And in, in all cases, we see uh, that the, uh, the New York animals are larger, heavier, and fatter uh, than the wild-caught animals, and those differences uh, persist. We've now gone uh, up to generation 25 of sib-sib mating, and we see these population differences uh, continuing to persist. We've measured, I'm just going to go through a couple of phenotypes to give you a feel for some of the population uh, differences. Uh, we've looked at blood chemistry in a variety of ways. Adiponectin levels uh, are higher and lectin levels are lower uh, in northern latitudes compared to uh, lower latitudes. Uh, these are uh, patterns that are also recapitulated in human populations. So there's some interesting parallels between humans and mice in traits like this. New York mice have lower glucose levels than Florida mice. Uh, we see this in males and in females. And New York mice build larger nests than Florida uh, mice. Uh, and so this is what we look, uh, what this looks like. We have a, a simple assay where we just measure how much cotton they pull down from the hopper in 24 hours. And if you do this for a, a mouse from New York, they make these giant nests. From uh, Florida, they make smaller nests. If you do it from a mouse from Brazil, they just sit on the cotton. They don't, they don't make much of a nest. <laughs> um, activity levels are different. Uh, uh, in, uh, so there's uh, higher activity levels in, in uh, mice from colder places compared to uh, warmer places. And I should say those differences in nest building uh, are seen even when you account for differences in activity level. 
Um, so those are the kinds of phenotypic differences that we see in the lab and that persist for many generations and uh, that we would like to try to get at the, the genetic basis of. So I've said most of this, how we've, we've done exome capture and low coverage whole genome. Uh, one of the issues, so the first thing we did was uh, scans for selection, just to ask in an agnostic way what genes are, uh, uh, appear to show signals of selection. And of course, when you do that, you worry about the correlated history of populations. Uh, and so uh, we've used this latent factor mixed model that accounts for the correlated history of populations uh, to find uh, allele frequencies that co-vary with some aspect of the environment after you take population structure into account. Now, in this case, it turns out that there's no isolation by distance. So mice do group by population, but along the eastern uh, coast of North America, nearby populations are not more closely related to, to one another. Uh, so we also just did the simple thing of uh, looking for genes that showed clinal patterns of variation. So we just looked for correlations with latitude uh, and looked at, at genes that are in the tails of the distribution. Uh, and if you do that, you uncover many of the same loci that you get when you use this latent factor mixed model. So what kind of genes show up when we just ask about selection? Well, here's an example. This is the melanocortin-3 receptor. Uh, we see strong correlations with latitude at a number of SNPs at this gene. If you look at nearby genes, this, this signal sort of decays quickly. Uh, I think, we think this is probably consistent with selection acting on standing variation. We don't see long haplotypes. Uh, we see this pattern independently in a number of, of transects. There are no non-synonymous SNPs uh, uh, in, in this gene, uh, so this suggests that it's probably associated with regulatory changes. Uh, and known phenotypes in lab mice include many of the phenotypic differences that we see between the ends of the populations. So this seems like a reasonable candidate, but it's, it's just that. It's just a, a candidate, nothing more. Um, in general, if we ask about all of the outlier SNPs, those that show strong signatures of selection, the vast majority uh, are regulatory. Very few are, are uh, non-synonymous. So uh, at least in this respect, this is very consistent with this sort of omnigenic view of adaptation or, or a quantitative trait being con controlled uh, by regulatory uh, changes. But of course, what we'd like to do is actually link those signatures of selection to specific phenotypes. Uh, so to do this, um, we used uh, gene expression as an intermediate uh, phenotype. So we've done RNA-seq on all of the same mice and looked for clinal patterns of expression variation uh, and then mapped cis-EQTL through associations with SNPs and verified those cis-EQTL using allele-specific expression in heterozygotes. And this is work that was done by Katya Mack, a former graduate student in my lab who's now a postdoc at Stanford with Hunter Fraser. And she, she's a certifiable, uh, nerdy uh, graduate student. Uh, so for her honeymoon, uh, she, she made it a point when she was on vacation in Scotland to visit Dolly the sheep. So I thought this is a good indication of how serious she was about genetics. Um, <clears throat> So we've used the, the combination of approaches that I just mentioned to look at the intersection uh, and identify uh, genes that may underlie some of the, the traits that we're interested in. So the genome scan for uh, selection, Klein's in gene expression, and, and cis-EQTL. And when you look at the intersection of, of those three approaches, there are only 17 genes that show up. And they're shown here on the outside uh, circle of, of uh, these Manhattan plots. And because we're working with mice, we've got a great database of uh, hypomorphic mutations and knockouts. So we can then ask which of these 17 genes in the lab show phenotypes that uh, resemble the ones that distinguish the ends of the cline. Uh, and so we've just added mutant phenotypes here uh, to this uh, circle. And that narrows us down from 17 to just six genes uh, for which there are known uh, lab mutants that uh, uh, recapitulate some of the differences we see between the ends of the cline. And so I'm just going to focus on the top two, ADAM17 and BCAT2, and show you what the data look like for each of those as a, a, a way of trying to narrow down genes that might actually underlie quantitative traits. So this is for ADAM17. Um, uh, it's a transmembrane protein uh, that's uh, involved uh, in the release of cytokines and growth factors in the receptors. 
Um, expression of this gene is correlated with latitude. Uh, there's a cis-EQTL, so there's a SNP uh, adjacent to this gene that's associated with its expression. Uh, that SNP shows clinal patterns of variation uh, along the east coast of North America and shows up as an outlier in this genome scan for selection. Some of this is not coming out in, in the transition from MAC to, to PC, but it's, a, it's an outlier here. Uh, and then uh, finally, um, uh, body mass uh, is correlated with expression at this gene. And these are body mass residuals, so this is body mass corrected for latitude because body mass varies clinally. We want to uh, just look at the residuals of that. And then finally, SNPs uh, at the same SNPs that show this clinal pattern of variation and effect expression are, are associated uh, with, with body mass. Um, a similar pattern is seen for uh, BCAT2. Expression is correlated with latitude. There's a cis EQTL. Body mass and expression are correlated, uh, and the SNP uh, is associated with, with body mass. So interestingly, oh, before I get to that, I, I should say one, one thing that we worried about in, in this approach is that this is a very structured sample. So we have five populations, 10 mice per population. Uh, and we're looking for correlations across all 50 individuals. And of course, what you'd really rather do is have a large sample from individual populations. So we did go back and look within individual populations. We only have 10 mice. Uh, but in all cases, the trend is in the, in the um, direction that you see in the total sample. Uh, that is, that body mass and expression are, are correlated. In some cases, it's individually significant. In most, it's not. But again, it's only 10 individuals. So, those two genes together account for close to 10% of the phenotypic variance uh, of, of body mass uh, in, our, in our sample. And I just want to contrast that with BMI in humans, where 97 loci account for only 2.7% of, of the variation uh, in, in body mass. And so I think this is an example where quantitative variation uh, is still controlled in, in mice, at least by some loci of larger effect. Uh, this is certainly consistent uh, you know, with some of the models that, that have been proposed and may also be driven in part by the degree of pleiotropy or lack thereof at, at particular genes. Uh, but I, I do think that some of this may be due to the fact that selection is very strong in these populations were uh, presumably uh, initially far from their optimum. How am I doing on time? You have another two minutes. OK. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk briefly about um, phenotypic plasticity uh, for these same traits. Uh, and this is something I've become interested in, um, in part because there have been a couple of papers in the last few years that have come to very different conclusions about the role of phenotypic plasticity in adaptation. So one was this paper from Cameron Gallimbor in Nature uh, four years ago with uh, David Resnick and, and Kim Hughes in Guppies, where they showed uh, that this is um, uh, plasticity for gene expression in the brain of guppies that are exposed uh, to a situation where predators are, are, are not present. And it turns out that the plasticity in gene expression in that case goes opposite in direction to populations that have evolved to be without predators. And so they were arguing that plasticity in gene expression is not adaptive uh, uh, and does not correspond, is actually, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm so tired, <laughs> jet lag, <laughs> negatively associated with, uh, uh, with the evolved difference, which, which uh, they suggest is, is the adaptive difference. So that's a case where plasticity is non-adaptive. An opposite situation is shown here. Uh, this is work uh, uh, from Ammon Coral and Rasmus Nielsen uh, on lizards that live on lava flows, uh, where it turns out if you put a lizard, uh, these lizards, on black lava, uh, they, they can change colors, and they evolve to become it, they, they just have a plastic response uh, that makes them darker, uh, but there's also a genetic component uh, that makes them further darker. So in that case, uh, it turns out that the plasticity uh, goes in the same direction as the adaptive response. 
Uh, and the idea there is that, well, if, if the plasticity goes in the same direction, that may facilitate colonization of the novel environment and genetic changes may come later. But I see this as sort of an interesting unresolved issue about the role of, of plasticity uh, uh, in, in adaptation. And so we've become interested in that and uh, have compared mice from cold places with mice from warm places in a full uh, sieve design in, in which we've reared them at 4 degrees Celsius and 20 uh, degrees Celsius. We've got, I'll show you organismal phenotypes. We haven't yet done the gene expression. Uh, and so males are on the right and females are on the left. Uh, blue is the cold uh, uh, population, so these are from New York. Red is the population from Brazil. And the dark lines are the ones reared uh, at room temperature, and the very light lines are those that are reared in the, in the cold. Uh, and so this is for body weight, and we um, see that New York mice, as I mentioned before, are heavier than Brazil mice, but we see no plasticity uh, for body weight when you, when you raise them in the cold. Uh, so in that case, there simply doesn't seem to be much plasticity. In contrast, uh, if you measure their tail length, uh, it turns out that there's a lot of plasticity uh, for, uh, for tail length. So New York mice have shorter tails than Brazil mice. The red line is above the blue lines. But if you take these uh, New York mice and you raise them uh, in the cold, they get even shorter tails. And if you take uh, New York mice and you raise them in the cold, uh, they, they also get, uh, get shorter uh, tails. So uh, tail length uh, is, is clearly a plastic trait. And it goes in the same direction as, as the adaptive response. Another phenotype that we've studied from this perspective is, is water consumption. Mice from Tucson, which is a very dry environment, drink less water than mice from any of the other populations. And so we thought, well, let's do the simple experiment of rearing mice with unlimited water and on a water-restricted regime uh, and measuring weight loss uh, when we restrict water. So this is the prediction. We might expect that mice without water lose weight, uh, but, so a plastic response, but that mice from the dry environment might lose less weight than mice from a wetter environment. And that's exactly what, what we see. Uh, so these are means, each line is a different mouse, and we see a slight difference, uh, but significant difference in the amount of water lost. Uh, and so then we looked at gene expression in the kidneys um, for these mice uh, that were raised on unlimited water and water-restricted rest uh, regimes. And the first thing to see in these, so this is gene expression in the kidney, mice by and large group by population. Uh, so the yellow are the desert mice, the green are the mice from a wetter environment, uh, and then the different treatments, hydrated and un unhydrated, are, are, uh, are below that. And so the first grouping is actually by population, uh, not by, uh, by treatment. And, and then if we just ask the question, in general, does the evolved response in gene expression go in the same direction or the opposite direction? Uh, as the plastic response, by and large, it goes in the same direction. So the plastic response uh, here mimics the differences that we see between populations uh, when reared in an environment with un unlimited uh, water. Uh, so this is just one example of that. So one gene that shows that pattern. Uh, the mice from the desert show higher expression of this gene than mice from a wet environment. Uh, but in both populations, we see a plastic response, and the plastic response goes in the same direction as the evolved response. And in particular, these mice from Edmonton that are raised with very little water have a sort of a level of expression that's equivalent to the baseline level of expression of, of Tucson uh, mice. Um, so we're interested in this idea that plasticity may, in some cases, facilitate the colonization of a new environment. So uh, what have I told you? Well, house mice uh, show clinal patterns of variation for many traits. Um, and these consistent patterns in different transects suggest that the traits are adaptive. Uh, these differences persist in the lab and therefore have a genetic basis. Uh, we think that most uh, adaptive evolution in these populations is due to changes in gene regulation. Uh, but that some mutations of large effect may be favored when selection is strong. And we have a few candidate genes uh, that we think might be amenable to functional tests. And finally, that phenotypic plasticity might facilitate the colonization uh, of, of new environments. So I've mentioned the people who did most of this work, Megan Pfeiffer, Rixie, and Katya Mack, and Noel Bittner and Mallory Ballinger, two other graduate students, also contributed. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.